What does the creation of humanity represent? That is, what event, if any, did we perceive in a jump-starting of consciousness, imagination, and the process of beginning to understand the bigger picture of existence? Our struggle to understand our existence has awakened our hidden nature of curiosity and enlightenment. And to what effect exactly did the prehistoric aurora event have on our ancestors' ability to conceive our presence here on the Earth? Prehistory is unknown to us because it no longer exists. The remnants of a past that is completely lost to us is only existing in stone and in the form of petroglyphs, geoglyphs, and other strange patterns left down for all time by a past presence of intelligence who documented the events they were actively witnessing in the sky as the etching of stone material took place by beings who were considered primitive. And we only consider this primitive people because of the passage of time and the recycling of their existence. The shocking revelation of petroglyph patterns not being of the abstract mind and in fact being literal representations of intense plasmatic events happening in space and raining down onto our planet through the protective atmospheric bubble could only have been realized now. That is, within the past 100 years, because we could simply not fathom these petroglyphs until we had the technological know-how to experiment in laboratory conditions. Replicating the Squatter Man as a zenith pinch auroral phenomena and further exploring the different stages of such forces as laid out in no uncertain terms and the now vital clues of the petroglyph record echoed all across the earth by dozens of separated cultures in a dramatic undertaking of documentation that is now the subject of constant study and understanding not only the past event but also what it might mean for our future existence. The profound events that shaped every culture in the world and their belief systems begins in space. Planet Earth was once a strangely different place to what we recognize today and the ancient Earthlings have reached across time and space to leave us the clues as to what was going on. Only by understanding these clues can we truly begin to awaken. The birth of civilization happened after these events and catalyzed our understanding of gods and religion, dance and belief. Prayer and communication and these facts are not in dispute. Could the planets have been visible to Earth observers a very long time ago? That is, as visible as the sun or the moon is today. In this sense, we would literally be living in the presence of the gods as David Talbot asserts in his book, The Saturn Myth. Could planetary powers have once ruled the celestial theater in the lost age of the gods? If the planets engaged with each other electrically when the orbits were set off differently than what they are today, then of course this would have inspired dramatic events to take place in the sky. This was documented by Earth observers over a very long time until that is, the planets seemed to go to war with one another, creating shocking and sudden sways in the intense sky events here on the Earth. And this would have detrimented the presence of any civilization, forcing survivors to shelter within Earth cave systems as the intensity unfolded. The petroglyphs and geoglyphs that have confounded our understanding are representations of these events, never to be forgotten and documented for all time, much to our discovery in recent times. Described by David Talbot as an event, as the most intense and chaotic time in human history, and the misrepresentation is that these observers somehow were inspired by events that could still occur today. This is the modern phenomena of ignorance, but the stable fact maintains that every single culture on this modern plane of existence are reenacting in their belief one way or another, a critical juncture that is the intense aurora event of prehistory when the planets were the gods. These electrical events have evoked the entire symbolic contents of human existence today from the serpent to the deluge and the stairway to heaven. The provoking of humanity by the apparent gods of old, the dramatic discharges in the sky being exchanged by the planets. According to a long established school of thought, 
man's consciousness of a supreme being emerged slowly from a primitive fascination with petty spirits and demons apparently inspired by the need for food and eventually into the global traditions of today. If we were to take this as fact without question, then we would believe that before the Hebrews, Greeks, and Hindus developed their ideas of a supreme god, they must have possessed beliefs and customs similar to those of modern day tribes of Africa, Australia, or Polynesia for that matter. The same processes are considered evident for developed cultures in modern times, simply because it is considered that these tribes are somehow stuck in a staid primitive state. But what if this was false? Based on these conclusions and only by slow development could a race rise above the ludicrous magic, totems, and fetishes of the savage brute. But a surprising awakening to this thought occurs when you consider the fact that the advocates of the various evolutionary theories and their fascination with present day primitive culture almost never concerns themselves with the oldest religious texts and symbols which have come down to us from prehistoric practices. The sacred hymns and eulogies of ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia reveal a tradition of a great god reaching back into prehistoric times, a comparison of early and later sources, rather than suggesting a development, actually indicates the disintegration of a once unified idea into magic, astrology, and other elements with which the evolutionists associated the first stages of religion. As attested by the Thunderbolts project, there are grounds for speaking of an archaic monotheism, astral in nature, existing long before the idea of God received its spiritual and philosophical elevation in Hebrews and Greek thought. To the ancients themselves, the entire question was simply a matter of concrete history. The present world is a fragmented copy of an earlier age, in which the supreme light God stood alone in a primeval sea occupying the cosmic center. Ancient Egyptian texts repeatedly invoke a singular figure worshipped as the greatest and highest light of the primeval age. According to the pyramid text, perhaps the world's oldest religious hymns, Atom, a god born in the abyss before the sky existed, before the earth existed. But the texts of all periods look back to the same primordial time when Atom shone forth alone. I came into being of myself in the midst of the primeval waters, states the God in the Book of the Dead. More than once, the coffin texts recall the time when Actum was alone before he had repeated himself. He was alone in the primeval waters, they say. I was the spirit in the primeval waters, he who had no companion when my name came into existence. Each locality in Egypt appears to have possessed its own special representative of the Father God. To some he was Horos, the God who came first into being when no other God had yet come into existence, when no name of anything had yet been proclaimed. Other traditions knew him as Ra, the God one who came into being in the beginning of time. O thou who didst give thyself birth, O one mighty one of myriad forms and aspects, king of the world. The followers of Amun proclaimed their god, the ancient of heaven, father of the gods. Ptah was the splendid god who existed alone in the beginning. The different local names of the primeval deity, though adding complexity to Egyptian religion as a whole, did not cloud the underlying idea. He is the god one, the only one, the father of beginnings, the supreme lord, the singular god, except whom at the beginning none other existed. Egyptian priests had a particular obsession with the past and their vivid portrait of the great god in his first appearance. Those who look for an unseen creator in early Egyptian religion will be disappointed. He is a visible and concrete power, the lord of terror. The memory of this solitary light god and creator was old as the most ancient Egyptian ritual. His appearance and eventual departure shaped every aspect of the Egyptian world view. So also in Mesopotamia, about which Stefan Landon raises the question of archaic monotheism. 
After prolonged study of Semitic and Sumerian sources, Stefan Langdon concluded that veneration of spirits and demons had nothing to do with the origins of Mesopotamian religion. Rather, both in Sumerian and Semitic religions, monotheism preceded polytheism and belief in good and evil spirits. He further notes that on the pictographic tablets of the prehistoric period, the picture of a star repeatedly appears. The sign, he claims, is virtually the only religious symbol in the primitive period, and in the early Sumerian language, this star symbol is the ideogram for writing God, High, Heaven, and Bright. It is also the ideogram of An, the oldest and loftiest of the Sumerian gods. Anu was the father of the gods and the central light at the universe summit, a god of terrifying splendor who govern heaven from his throne in the cosmic sea of Apsu. But the Sumero-Babylonian pantheon filled with competing figures of the primordial creator. Here, as in Egypt, the god of archaic monotheism is not a transcendent spirit or invisible power, but a central light. A Sumerian epic proclaims, Anu is the midst of heaven, gave him fearful splendor. According to the text, is like Anu and cast a shadow of glory over the land. Egyptian and Mesopotamian traditions of the solitary creator find many parallels in the later Hebrew, Greek, Persian, Hindu, and Chinese mysticism and philosophy. But it is the earliest imagery which illuminates the later and however unorthodox the idea may seem. The oldest records treat the great God's birth in the deep and his acts of creation as events experienced by the ancestors. Hearts were pervaded with fear, hearts were pervaded with terror when I was born in the abyss, proclaims the God in the pyramid text. The tradition has nothing to do with the origins of our planet or the universe, and the subject of the original creation legend is the formation of the greatest God's visible dwelling above. The legend records that when the creator rose from the cosmic sea, a great band of revolving islands congealed around the god as his home. The band appeared as well-defined, organized, and geometrically unified dwelling, a celestial abode fashioned by the Great Father. All space outside this enclosure belongs to unorganized chaos. The word which in the ancient language denotes this enclosure receives various translations as heaven, cosmos, world, land, earth, netherland. These are the terms which take on vastly different meanings in modern usage. In their original sense, the words signified one and the same thing, a band of light which appears to set apart the sacred ground of the great god from the rest of space. What is most compelling about the portrait of Aktam Ra is that numerous Egyptian divinities duplicate the image and the very traits of the great god are endlessly repeated in the figures of Osiris, Ptah, and Horus, of whom appears as the solitary god in the fiery sea, the god one who brought forth the company of gods as his own limbs, the god of the reverberating speech, the unmoving god producing the celestial revolutions and the final source of water and the impregnating seed of the cosmos. If we were to inquire of an Egyptian priest how he arrived at this notion of the supreme god, the priest would tell us that he did not arrive at the idea at all. The great god was a historical divinity who ruled heaven for a time, then departed amid great upheavals. The hymns and ritual texts simply record the incarnation of the god in the primordial era and recount the massive cataclysms which accompanied the collapse of that era as documented in the forms of petroglyphs all over the world. But what do you guys think about this anyway? Comments below and as always, thank you for watching.